In video 44 of the Foundations of Computational Economics, we're looking at yet another solution method, which is called newton kantorowicz method or newton kantorowicz iterations. We have seen uh, that different solution methods can differ drastically in their numerical performance. Right? Uh, VFI, value function iterations, although it is globally convergent, because the Bellman uh, operator is a contraction mapping, the rate of convergence is given by the modulus of contraction, and in many of our models it's just beta. So uh, with beta close to 1, VFI converges really slowly. Uh, time iterations uh, it performs a little bit better, even though theoretically it is equivalent. Uh, convergence seems to be faster, uh, or happens to be faster, primarily because we are interpolating um, simpler objects like policy function and we're making less uh, uh, less of a numerical error. Now in the last video we have seen that policy iterations converge much much faster in the problems where we can uh, um, cast the problem of ev evaluating a particular policy function as a simple system of linear equations. Now newton kantorowicz is uh, a solution method which is based on the idea that solving for the fixed point of the Bellman operator uh, can be approached as an equation problem, as a, as a, a searching for a, for, an, for a root of a particular equation. And therefore, newton raphson algorithm should be applicable. But the thing is that, uh, you know, Bellman operator is a functional equation, so do we have the theory to apply newton raphson And if we can, of course, then this method should be really fast as well. Well, Leonid Vitalievich Kantorovich uh, was a Russian mathematician and Soviet mathematician who lived in Leningrad and uh, Novosibirsk. He's made uh, contributions to the linear programming uh, um, theory, which we uh, looked at in video 18, uh, and also uh, uh, fundamental contributions to the functional analysis, in particular what we're interested in. And then he shared the Nobel Prize uh, in economics in 1975 for the contributions of optimal allocation of resources. Uh, the contributions of Kantorovich uh, to functional analysis and uh, numerical ap applications are summarized in his 1948 paper, uh, which uh, essentially uh, includes uh, the works that he started uh, in around 1937. Uh, so, in this paper, he uh, concludes the, uh, the building of the general approximation theory for solving functional equations using uh, so-called finite approximations. Uh, with this approach, he generalized uh, the gradient descent in the Newton method for functional equations and derived uh, uh, several results on existence of solutions, uh, the convergence uh, of approximated solutions, uh, and the rates and error bounds uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this convergence. Um, so uh, the central result that uh, is usually referred to but has several variants is uh, called Kantorowicz theorem, and it has to do with an operator f uh, that maps a Banach space or a, sub, uh, a subset of Banach space into itself. Uh, and we are interested in solving uh, a sort of a usual equation, except now f is an operator, uh, right? We're using, we, we are, we are um, looking for the solutions which are functions that satisfy this equation, and zero, of course, is also a zero function in here. Um, the Newton step, if we just apply the Newton approach, looks like this. And essentially, uh, Kantorowicz said that you can do this, okay? But you have to use uh, finite approximations to the uh, to the operator. And now, what is this uh, f uh, prime? What's the derivative of the of the of the operation of the operator in the functional space? He basically set up and uh, the problem in the correct in the rigorous way, and showed that under certain regularity conditions listed here. And I don't want to go into details about this uh, uh, boundless conditions and, you know, these conditions here. But he basically showed that that f of x has a solution in a particular uh, ball, uh, um, and that the sequence uh, given by the Newton step uh, that we saw in the previous slide converges to this solution with a quadratic rate. And that's essentially what we need uh, to be able to apply this approach 
to our Bellman operator, right? So here's the Bellman operator in, written in a, in a general form. And of course, we need to find the fixed point of this operator to solve the problem. Uh, and it, is satis it, it, it does satisfy this equation, uh, the fixed point equation, that we can uh, approach using the, uh, the Newton ideas. Well, Newton Kantarovich iterations in this case because we are solving uh, a functional equation. And that's basically the main idea under this, uh, under this approach. Uh, as you would imagine, it, it's going to be working much, much faster because of the uh, fast convergence of the Newton method. Quadratic convergence, uh, in fact. Whereas VFI uh, converges linearly, uh, and uh, the rate of convergence um, or the rate of reduction in the errors, in the approximation errors for the VFI, is really dictated by the, um, uh, by, by, by the modulus of contraction, by our beta. Now, um, what is uh, that uh, operator's derivative? Well, uh, rigorously defined, this is a free shade derivative of the Bellman operator that we need to code up. Uh, and uh, this is a, this is a generalization uh, of a, 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 a derivative of a function in Banach space. That's that's the way to think about it. All right, um, we will uh, go back to the uh, Rust model of bus engine replacement, because John, in his 1987 paper, essentially introduced the Newton Kantarovich iterations to uh, in economics. And uh, um, using this 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 uh, this approach was essential for him uh, to be able to resolve the model many 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 times in order to estimate uh, the structural parameters uh, of uh, of the decision maker Harold Zerker. Um, and uh, we will look more closely at the estimator that is uh, derived in this paper uh, uh, in 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 the video. Uh, in one video. But I refer you to, to video 28 for the setup of the problem and video 29 where we've implemented uh, the code for the, uh, for the Rust uh, slash Zerker model. Um, and here just a very short uh, reminder of what the model is. So it's the choice of keep, uh, to keep or to replace an engine of the bus, uh, which comes into a workshop, conditional on the observed mileage, and many things which are unobserved by a kinematrician, but are observed by Harold Zucker, uh, the superintendent who is making this uh, replacement decisions. Uh, finite, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this, the model is set in infinite horizon in discrete time. Uh, the mileage process, which is in principle continuous, uh, is discretized into a number of bins, and we have a band diagonal transition probability matrix uh, for transitioning between these beans, uh, which is estimated exogenously uh, from the data. So here's that matrix. Of course, it depends on whether the bus is replaced uh, or the engine is replaced or not, because you can think of, uh, you know, rows of this matrix corresponding to different mileages. Uh, there's going to be 175 as in the paper, but it could be discretized in many different ways, uh, this mileage process. So these are the mileages that the bus has driven uh, in period t, and in the next period t plus one, these are the probabilities that the bus will drive so much. And of course, this is, uh, you know, the probability that a new bus, which has zero mile uh, mileage uh, in the beginning, would drive this huge amount is completely zero. No bus can drive, uh, uh, you know, above a certain. Uh, a certain uh, normal amount of uh, mile, uh, miles uh, in a time period. So therefore we have many zeros and just a few numbers uh, for this uh, transition probabilities. And that gives this whole matrix this band uh, diagonal structure. Now, if the bus is, or if the engine is replaced, then the transition probabilities are given by the first row uh, of of this matrix, so essentially keeping uh, the new uh, or keeping the engine in the new bus, or keeping the new engine or replacing the engine leads to the same uh, transition probabilities, uh, which are all in the first row, and that allows us to economize on the uh, uh, in the when 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 implementing the model. Now, uh, that allows us not to distinguish between the transition probabilities conditional on the decision and just work with one 
uh, uh, bearing in mind that the first row corresponds to the decision uh, of replacement. Now, uh, the preferences in this model, the, uh, the flow payoffs, instantaneous payoffs, uh, as you would remember, are given by the costs uh, with the idea that if the engine is replaced, then uh, uh, the maintenance cost uh, um, component, which is denoted by C here, is going to be the maintenance of the new bus, uh, but uh, a replacement cost must be paid. Uh, similar, similarly, if the engine is not replaced, then it's just the maintenance cost corresponding to that particular mileage, uh, mileage bracket that needs to be that needs to be uh, incurred. Uh, remember uh, the three independent uh, three independence assumptions made in the model uh, with respect to the error term, the unobserved state variables, are as follows: the error terms are independent across observations. Uh, well, due to random sampling, uh, the error terms come in pairs, so the error term uh, corresponds to the uh, corresponding to the decision of replacement uh, is one, and the 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 an error term, a separate error term, that corresponds to the decision of keeping is the other one, and they're independent across choices. Now, finally, conditional on mileage, there is no serial cor correlation uh, across the uh, uh, error terms, and these are the three assumptions. Made by uh, made by John that leads to the uh, following simplification of the Bellman equation. In principle, Bellman equation uh, that we would write as a function uh, using the value function, which is the function of the state space, as always, uh, takes this form, right? Uh, but now, oh, and we can rewrite the expectation here. As a double integral, this is the, the integral over the uh, uh, joint uh, transition density uh, 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 for the uh, two variables in the state space, the observed mileage and the unobserved uh, shock, so this unobserved components, um, right as it says here. Now, to formalize the assumptions, we can write that uh, um, uh, uh, in addition to the independence assumptions, which are standard to the uh, to the discrete choice modeling, uh, Rust makes the following three additional assumptions. So one is additive se separability in preferences, so that you can separate the uh, the error term from the rest of the utility function. So it's like the utility function has a deterministic component, uh, and that's just cost, right? And we don't really know. Uh, how cost uh, affects the uh, uh, um, how the random term affects the cost in monetary terms, so it's just separated out here. Uh, now, conditional independence: this uh, joint density for the two state variables can be separated as a product into the evolution of miles, and this is what we've uh, seen in the matrix, right? Axes are miles traveled, and then uh, there is a a, a, a conditional uh, in principle, distribution of the error terms conditional on the new realized uh, um, uh, amount of miles. And then we also assume that these error terms are distributed as uh, um, extreme value type 1 uh, distribution that will lead to the logit structure in the choice probability. So this is uh, essentially, this is coming from the, uh, from the theory of discrete choice. Uh, and uh, with this, what we can do is we can rewrite the uh, the uh, val uh, the Bellman equation in the following way. Well, we insert the uh, uh, the product with the transition probability here. We uh, uh, write the utility function, uh, the payoff function, uh, explicitly like that. Um, uh, right. Um, so we separate choice specific value function using the uh, uh, additive separability, um, uh, we can compute the expectation by part now that this uh, double integral can be separated uh, uh, according to E uh, and, uh, uh, and pi. And we will use max stability property just in a second to show uh, the next step. So here's the, uh, the derivation. We uh, introduce new notation, which is the small v of x and d, and this is the deterministic 
component of the choice specific value right it depends on some states and it depends on the choice it depends on the observed state and it uh, depends on the on the choice so it's choice specific uh, value function and it is deterministic component because it only uh, depends on the observed state uh, we're just going to say that this is the whole uh, thing uh, uh, um, marked here now here's our uh, integration that we can do now in a nested way we first integrate out the the epsilon uh, the unobserved part uh, right um, and so um, with this new notation we can rewrite uh, the, the 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 Bellman equation itself uh, very in, in a very short uh, way here right it's just the maximum uh, over the uh, deterministic part plus the shock and um, this thing can now be plugged into here and you can see that we are calculating the expected the expected maximum of some random variables here well, this is where the uh, uh, extreme value type one assumption comes in very handy, because these uh, um, these random variables in here uh, they inherit the the distribution uh, from the from the epsilons, and the uh, extreme value distributions they have the the max stability property, so the maximum of these random variables is distributed with the same uh, distribution extreme value type one. And uh, we only have to apply a special formula to calculate the uh, expectation. And the formula is analytic, and it's given by this log sum function. Uh, dx, yeah, dx should be still here. So this log sum function uh, is the analytical expression for this inner integral. All right, and that follows from the ex extreme value type 1 distributional assumption. Okay, uh, so um, now we are looking at this integral specifically, and we are plugging in our expressions for the uh, small v's, and we are using the uh, uh, the analytical uh, form of the expectation, and this is what we're going to call the expected value function. This this expectation that we've written here, as you can see, this is a function of of uh, x and d. Uh, right, because the x prime is integrated out, and uh, an epsilon disappears because it's integrated out in the analytical way. So this is going to be a function of x d, the expected value function, which is also choice specific, uh, at least in general. Actually, thinking back about the uh, uh, about the uh, um, inventory management problem, there the uh, expected value was not the function of the choice. Uh, right. Um, uh, and that's that was just the that was just the detail in that particular model. So in general, the expected value should be the function of the choice. Although uh, as we see in in um, uh, um, I should I, I, sh I should say it in a different way. In general, the expected value is the function of the choice. Uh, but in the in the bus engine replacement model, we can do the trick where the expected value of the choice to replace is just represented by the first component of the uh, of the same vector of the vector representing the uh, expected value of the choice to keep. So it they collapse uh, this expected value of x and d collapse into the expected value of x, as we saw in uh, video twenty nine. Uh, when we uh, implemented uh, when we implemented the uh, um, uh, uh, the Zerker model in the code, yeah, uh, we were talking about this uh, over here. The fact that we can replace uh, the fact that we can represent uh, the uh, EV function of xd using just the VEV of x and you and reusing the the first component of of the vector. All right. Um, to conclude the the transformation of the Bellman equation, and I'm still s repeating what uh, what is part of video twenty eight, just to refresh your memory and maybe uh, uh, you know help you understand better. Um, with this new notation, with this new notation, uh, we can uh, we can have. Um, 
we can rewrite uh, what we had on the previous slide and uh, uh, basically remember that the V, uh, which was also introduced here, is nothing else than U plus B uh, times the whole expectation that we are, that we are just uh, introduced here. Okay, so on one hand, we have this expression for the expected value uh, using the, the small v's, the deterministic part of, parts of the choice-specific values. Uh, and, and the latter, they can be expressed through the uh, expected value themselves. So plugging uh, th these expressions into here, uh, we arrive at the, uh, uh, at the Bellman equation and Bellman operator in the expected value function space. And this is simply given um, uh, uh, by, by these expressions. And I'm also rewriting now the, uh, um, the uh, integrals with the sums over all possible future values uh, of mileage. And they are given, uh, uh, you know, the integrals are given now by the weighted sums. Uh, everything inside is the same, except that now I've also plugged in this uh, expressions for the small v's. And uh, the uh, Bellman uh, operator is now has a star, uh, and that's to signify that this is an operator expressed in the expected value function space. Uh, as I've uh, said uh, uh, back in, in video 28, it, it is also a contraction mapping, and we can apply standard value function iteration solver to solve this as we did in video 29. Uh, just to uh, conclude this exposition, uh, uh, what's the policy function in this setting? Well, the policy function with uh, the uh, unobserved state spaces, uh, I mean, the policy function as a function of x and d, uh, just like in the inventory management problem, uh, would be defined in the normal way, right, as a function of uh, that, that, that achieves the argmax in the, in the Bellman equation. But because we are not observing the uh, uh, the unobserved state, then in this model the policy can be also represented by the choice probability to replace an engine or to keep the engine rather, or well anyone uh, really, and the choice probability is given by the logit formula where we are, have the exp over the sum of exp well sum of exp uh, of of the values uh, and the values are given by this deterministic components of the uh, uh, choice specific value function. Uh, and I'm uh, I, we can divide by the exp of uh, uh, enumerator to to get something like this. That's the same probability. So this is probability of keeping uh, as I'm writing it for the for the zero. Okay, so uh, um, thinking about all we know about the uh, solution methods for the dynamic models, let's classify the Rust model and, and think about what solution methods would uh, be applicable in principle. So it is an infinite horizon, which gives us more choices uh, right away. It has discretized mileage, uh, which is the only state in the uh, in the expected value function formulation. So it is like the model has a finite state space and it has discrete choice. So this is a very standard sequential discrete choice uh, uh, model uh, with idiosyncratic random components. Uh, so going back to video 37 on the, uh, on the uh, uh, theory of dynamic programming, we can conclude or find it in there uh, that um, uh, value functions that iterations apply to this to this model uh, as they uh, apply to any infinite horizon model um, uh, uh, and that's what we already implemented now policy iterations also apply to this model uh, and we just looked at them in the previous video uh, although it, it would take some thinking uh, about how to implement the policy iterations uh, in, the, uh, in the engine replacement model. The uh, uh, magnific magnificent thing is, is that uh, particularly in this model, uh, and uh, uh, it holds for all uh, finite state space model with models with discrete choice, uh, it actually, uh, the method that we are studying today is going to be... Uh, um, 
uh, it's going to lead to essentially the same mathematical formulas as the policy iterations. So uh, uh, today's newton kantorovich method uh, coincides uh, with policy uh, iterations for some uh, models, including the, the Rust model of engine re replacement. But uh, we'll study newton kantorovich uh, as such uh, uh, using, using the engine replacement. And we already have uh, uh, found out what policy iterations are. Okay, so um, what is the uh, newton kantorovich uh, can I increase? Yeah, okay. Uh, what is the newton kantorovich iterations method? Well, like I said, the uh, we have to solve, to solve the model, we have to solve the, for this uh, fixed point, right? The expected value is the same uh, as uh, uh, what the operator, the Bellman operator returns. And uh, I'm going to reintroduce uh, uh, or re uh, 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 relabel the Bellman operator in the expected value function space with this gamma, just because we're going to use it a lot and I don't like the, to get around the star. So this equation here uh, can be rewritten as such equation uh, like this, right, where i is the identity operator that does not change uh, the uh, input argument. So here we have the i minus gamma uh, applied, which is a new operator in itself, right? This is a new operator equal, uh, that is equal to the, uh, uh, to the difference of two operators. It is applied to some ev function of x and d, and when it is applied to this function, we should get the zero function, the function that returns zero for every input. Um, all right, uh, the uh, newton kantorovich iteration is then like uh, written like this, right? So we need to have the derivative of, of, of this operator and we need to inverse it uh, or divide by it. Divide what? The uh, result of this operator uh, uh, applied to the previous iteration of EV, EV uh, function EV. Uh, and that whole thing needs to be subtracted from this uh, previous iteration EV function to get the new the, the new updated uh, approximation or a new member of this sequence of approximations. Um, so like I said, the new operator is the difference between the identity operator and the Bellman operator, zero function. Now uh, this here is, uh, is a Frechet derivative of the uh, uh, Bellman operator. The derivative of the um, the derivative with of the identity operator is going to be just itself, right? This is like f of uh, it's like uh, f of x equals um, uh, equals uh, x, right? Um, and um, so, so the whole uh, expression here gives the derivative of this operator forming the uh, the newton kantorovich step. Uh, what's happening? All right. Um, now let's talk about the final finite approximations of all of these objects. Uh, well, imagine that we've uh, uh, discretized the mileage process into n bins. So we have n points in the state space. And what is EV of x and of xd? Uh, it is given by a vector, right? A vector of length n, which uh, uh, makes a correspondence between each point of the of the mileage, uh, discretized mileage process to the expected value uh, here. Um, and we're going to assume right away that the first element of EV, of the vector EV, is reused to describe the expected value of replacing. This is the trick that we looked at in video 29. Uh, now, the, uh, the result, or the operator itself, the operator gamma, the Bellman operator on the expected value functions, is some nonlinear transformation some uh, of, of the uh, EV vectors. So it's a nonlinear n-valued multivariate function, okay, of EV. That's what this operator is if we approximate EV with a vector. But the Frechet derivative of this operator is just an n by n matrix, right? This is a, this is a matrix of uh, derivatives of each of the outputs 
of this uh, nonlinear and valued multivariate function with respect to each of the inputs. Okay, so the Frechet derivative uh, is actually just a matrix. Um, and so uh, it appears that the NK iterations on finite approximations are actually similar to solving a system of N equations uh, with uh, N unknowns using Newton method. So it's like we're solving uh, a system of N nonlinear equations. Right. Um, now to, uh, uh, to do it, uh, uh, to differentiate the Bellman operator, and uh, we are now working towards the, uh, uh, this Frechet derivative and how to code it up, uh, we can represent first the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, operator mm, in the matrix notation. Okay, that's the first step. So uh, it's quite uh, simple, actually. It's now that we, now that we said that we're going to be thinking about the EV of xd as a single vector of values uh, corresponding to the points in the state space. Now let's write this this whole operator as uh, um, uh, as the uh, uh, as a sort of in in matrix algebra terms. Uh, EV is going to be a vector. This sum uh, with, oh, I'm missing probabilities. There are probabilities here, transition probabilities. The sum of these function, uh, the log sum times the probabilities, it can be represented uh, by multiplying the transition probability matrix pi, denoted as capital pi here. And this is an n by n matrix of mileage transition probabilities. Uh, by the result of uh, the function L, that is a log sum function, which returns an n by one vector, and it has all the n by one column vectors as inputs, uh, that is applied to two vectors inside here. One is the uh, utility plus the beta EV, where EV is the whole uh, n by one column vector, and utility is an n by one column vector as well, of course, for all points of the state space. Okay, conditional on decision as it should be. Now over here, the utility is still uh, a column vector, but the EV naught is just a scalar, right? So no matter where we are uh, in the uh, state space, if we replace, then the, ex the expected value uh, uh, is given by the first element of the EV vector, as we said. And so I'm using this notations with square brackets to denote the ith element of a vector. And I'm also using the base zero indexing like we do in Python. Okay, so what do we have then? We have this, uh, uh, you know, matrix notation expression that, uh, we, that is the same as the Bellman operator. Uh, and this is actually how we implemented it in the code already. All right, so let's uh, now think about how to differentiate uh, this operator given with this matrix operations uh, with respect to EV. And that means that we are differentiating with respect to all values or all elements of this vector EV. Well, uh, the derivative is going to be given by an n by n matrix. And you can see it right away that we still have to multiply with the probability uh, transition probability matrix. Uh, as they are just, uh, uh, you know, multipliers, the coefficients, but we have to compute this, uh, uh, this derivative of the log sum function applied to a column vector with respect to all possible uh, elements in, in EV. So let's look at how that's done. Well, first, uh, um, if we just think about how to, how log sum function in general uh, uh, can be differentiated uh, with respect to a scalar. Let's look at this example. Uh, imagine we have a log sum of uh, w1, w2. This is the expression. Uh, we remember that this, this is the expectation of the maximum of the uh, wi plus ei, where the two, uh, oh, uh, epsilon i, where the two epsilons are distributed independently with type one, type one, uh, type one uh, extreme value distribution. Uh, and um, 
because of this distributional assumption, uh, we can define uh, this, uh, this expression here, which actually uh, denotes the, uh, uh, um, or constitutes the choice probability uh, of choosing one of these options, you know, W1 or W2, where the, uh, the log sum itself is the expectation of the, of the maximum of these of this, of this values. So it corresponds sort of one-to-one -to, -one to, the, to the random utility framework in discrete choice. And then we have this expression. So the, the, the derivative of the, uh, uh, of the log sum function with respect to some scalar is just given by the probability weighted sum of the derivatives of the uh, uh, underlying utilities, underlying values. Okay, with this, with this at hand, we can start thinking about how uh, the uh, how to calculate this derivative of the log sum function that we are working with uh, in the uh, bus engine replacement model with respect to all different EVs. And I'm going to differentiate here first the case where we are uh, uh, where we're taking the derivative with respect to the EV uh, of i or the ith element where i is greater than zero. So not the first element and therefore you know in the result here the first column is just going to be uh, replaced by this bullets uh, because we're not saying anything about that yet but uh, for the other um, for the other elements what can we say well um, look back here uh, the log sum function is applied to these two expressions. And we're differentiating with EV, uh, which is not the first element, so not, uh, not this one. So the second, the second uh, uh, value in the log sum function uh, does not depend on the EVs except for the first one, right? So this is gonna just give zero uh, in the expression of the, uh, of, of the uh, uh, derivative of the log sum function here. So this is gonna be zero for many of this uh, for many of these EVs, the elements of the E ve vector, and we are only left with this. Okay, and what do we do? What do we have here? Well, here we are differentiating with different elements of this E v vector, but for all of them, I just multiplied with a beta. So it's going to be just beta that is the derivative of the log sum function. We only have to oh beta, I'm sorry, beta multiplied with this with this choice probability, of course. Uh, and so we only have to worry about where in the matrix they are going to reside. All right, well, um, uh, if we're differentiating with the first, uh, uh, oh, with the second element of the EV vector, which is indexed one, then um, it is, uh, it is uh, the, uh, the same indexed, so the, the same second element on this column uh, of EVs that it, uh, of, of this else that it depends on, right? Uh, again, so this L uh, log sum returns the column vector that depends on, this, on these EVs, and we are differentiating with all possible other different EVs. Well, it's only the second element that depends on the second element of the EV, right? Because this, this, this happens element by element. In the first row, we will have the, util the first element of the utility plus B to the first element of EV. And therefore, it's only in the second row uh, of, of this column L that we, have the, uh, uh, that we have something that depends on the second element of of the vector EV. And therefore, there we will have beta times the uh, corresponding choice probability, probability of keeping. And uh, the same logic applies to all of the rest of, this, uh, of these columns. So each column is, is, the, uh, uh, is the derivative with respect to the next, to each particular element in the EV. So uh, this is with the first, with respect to the first element, second element, third element, and so forth. And so we get this nice uh, uh, diagonal structure here uh, in the columns starting from the, from the second one. And yeah, uh, P of I, this is a shortcut notation uh, for the probability of keeping calculated for a particular point in the state space.
the ith points in a state space. Okay, now with uh, when we're differentiating with EV naught, what's the difference? The difference is that now the log sum function uh, depends, uh, both components of the log sum function depend on the EV naught, right? Because it also enters here. But it also only enters with the, uh, uh, with the coefficient beta. So it will be the beta times the probability of keeping uh, we, we go in here. So both this and this are just betas. So we will be left just with the sum of the probabilities. And that we can write uh, 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 down here. Beta and the sum of probabilities. Of course, in the first element here, uh, we will have both probabilities. And in the other elements, uh, this component now will, will be zero because because uh, uh, if if the engine is capped, then uh, you know this EV just corresponds to the uh, to the row uh, the row index uh, in this column vector of L, and therefore we have two probabilities in the first element, but then we only have the probability of replacing that are entering uh, this this derivative with respect to the first uh, element of vector EV. Now, this is of course one. These are complementing uh, the probabilities of the complementary events, but I'm gonna keep them like this because th it's just gonna be easier to compute them this way. So finally, going back to the expression for the free shade derivative, uh, we have to remember about this transition probability that we're multiplying with, and we just uh, talked about this complicated matrix. Uh, and here's the uh, uh, my my uh, um, attempt to write this this product uh, in the matrix form. So this is the this is the probability of the uh, um, uh, of the log sum function that we just talked about. This is the transition probability matrix, and we don't forget this beta that came out of of this part. All right, so let's think about it. So uh, you know, this row, these three numbers have to be multiplied with the first numbers here, and the rest is going to be zero, and that's going to be the first element in the result, and so forth. This row is going to be multiplied with this one to get the uh, you know the, the 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 result in the first row, second column, and so forth. Standard matrix multiplication, and you can see that there are so many zeros all around here. And essentially what we will end up with, so uh, this element will be multiplied with this choice probability and, and, and this element is going to be multiplied with this choice probability. So, so the result will have the same structure as the transition probability here, at least in the second to the last columns. But each of these transition probabilities will be multiplied with the corresponding choice probability of keeping. And it's only in the first column that things are different, right? Because in the first column, we are multiplying this transition probability rows with the column uh, column of 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 the uh, uh, keep probabilities, and therefore I'm, I, this separation is is useful. Uh, so th this is what we're going to have. So first is the matrix which basically matches the uh, transition probability uh, uh, values with the corresponding choice probabilities of keeping. You know the the zero uh, the choice the the keeping the probability of keeping of the new engine, uh, you know from the first bin, uh, second bin, and third force in mileage, uh, and these are multiplied element by element as you can see to the uh, uh, transition probability elements, and then in addition to that we have to add something to the first column, and what do we add? Well, we add this this matrix is written as a matrix multiplication of uh, choice probability, uh, sorry, transition probabilities with the probabilities of keeping, and then all the the other uh, columns are just zeros. So this is an addition to the first column uh, of this uh, resulting free shade derivative, and that's it. Uh, it was uh, not easy. You may want to uh, uh, sort of uh, rewind and 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 listen to the explanation again. Or better still, you could just uh, write down these matrices for yourself on a piece of paper and, and really understand how the uh, um, how these different elements of the matrices combine 
to form uh, the Frechy derivative. Once it's done, then we can uh, run our newton kantorovich iterations. Uh, and the algorithm is very simple. We just initialized the EV at some starting value. Well, the only thing is now with Newton method, the starting value does matter, right? Because Newton is not globally convergent. Uh, and then performing newton kantorovich step, computing the policy function along the way, so the choice probabilities, uh, while applying the Bellman operator gamma, uh, and this is this, the formula for the newton kantorovich step, and then we iterate on, 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 this, on this formula, you know, many, many times, until we converge. Oh, this, this one is uh, not correct. Um, until we converge. And convergence is quadratic. So um, I want to go uh, down to the uh, um, additional learning resources. And there should be a title here. Everything that I said is part of so-called NFXP manual, where the NFXP is the nested fixed point uh, estimator that we will talk about uh, in video 46. Uh, but it, it details the uh, uh, creation of the Frechet derivative and the structure of the Frechet derivative really well. So you, want, uh, you, you may want to go uh, back and read that, that resource as well. Okay, so let's look at the implementation of the newton kantor rich method. Uh, and I should probably go back to the uh, uh, go to the normal uh, notebook view. This is the code here, which is copied uh, more or less from the uh, twenty video twenty nine, where we developed uh, the Zerka class, the implementation of the bus engine replacement model. Uh, and uh, the difference here is now that um, I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna code up uh, the Newton Kantorovich. Uh, um, uh, uh, solution method in real time here, but let me go through the code anyway and explain what's happening here. So if we compare uh, the codes, there are some differences in the Bellman equation. And let's see. So uh, you can see the one obvious difference is that the uh, um, that the comments are now tidied up. We start with the self grid. And this is self grid uh, thought of the uh, of the next period state. We calculate the costs for the next period, same thing as we do here. We calculate the vx naught and vx one uh, as one dimensional arrays uh, uh, of. So these are the small v's. These are the uh, the choice specific uh, uh, values, the deterministic parts of them, and then we calculate the log sum. So all of this is the same. Uh, in 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 the previous code and now, and now look here. Previously, we converted log sum into the column vector and multiplied that uh, to the uh, transition probability matrix, and then we had to do this arrayval operation, which is uh, flattening the result into a one-dimensional array. Uh, after all, well, that's actually not needed. Uh, this symbol, even though this is a matrix operation. Uh, this is implemented by uh, Matt uh, Mull, I think. That's what implements the matrix uh, uh, product uh, denoted by by this symbol. Matt Mull implements the semantics of the uh, matrix operation. And uh, if we read the manual here, and that's always useful and never late, you can see that if you're multiplying two matrices, x1 and x2, it, the result depends on the dimensions of this uh, of these. And you know, after we've been working with uh, the three-dimensional arrays in the uh, stochastic consumption savings problem, and used the dot product, uh, uh, which is uh, an alternative, um, it, it, uh, it 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 became obvious that that. Um, uh, 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 for matrix operations, NumPy actually does provide a very nice way to work with one-dimensional arrays where you have to multiply them uh, with matrices in the normal linear algebra way. So same thing here. If both arguments are 2D, then they're uh, multiplied like conventional matrices. That's what we've been relying on so far. But look at this statement here. Uh, if the first argument is 1D, then it's promoted to a matrix prepending one to its dimensions. So 
prepending one, that means that one is added on the left, right, as a first dimension. And so if it's a one-dimensional array, then it becomes a, a, a row uh, a vector. But in the, if the second argument is one-dimensional array, it is promoted to matrix by appending one. That means uh, adding one to the end of the shape. And that becomes makes it uh, uh, from a one-dimensional array to a, a column vector. What's more important is that after matrix multiplication, the uh, appended one is removed. Uh, and therefore, we can just multiply a matrix with a one-dimensional array, then one-dimensional array will uh, um, appear as a column vector, and then we don't need to do the, the flattening, the Ravel operation, because it is automatically done then. Okay, now another uh, important difference is here. So look, we've recomputed the, uh, uh, the, the values, uh, the choice-specific uh, deterministic values, for the current period to calculate the choice specific, I'm sorry, the choice probability uh, over here. Uh, and that was fine. Uh, this, uh, you know, the, the, this, was, this was okay. This was, uh, uh, this was corresponding to the convention that the Bellman operator returns the policy function that corresponds to the current period, not the next period. Uh, of time. Uh, of course, uh, in the solution where we found the, uh, where once we found the fixed point, these two are the same, they are time invariant, and therefore this doesn't have to do anything with the solution, uh, but uh, with intermediate output. Now here, because we need to have this choice probability uh, to be able to calculate the Frechet derivative, right? Uh, the choice probabilities enter uh, into the expressions for the Frechet derivative. They, it is important to keep them in correspondence to the log sum that we are calculating here. The log sum is calculated using uh, these uh, uh, values uh, that correspond to the next period uh, um, uh, rather than the current period. And uh, therefore, we're using this uh, new, note, uh, new convention, I would say, that the Bellman equation returns the policy corresponding not to the current but to the next period. And again, this is this is fine. This is these are differences in the uh, implementation details, even though they are important, uh, especially if you're comparing the outputs from from different implementations. Uh, but uh, um, fundamentally, we're not changing the solution, right? Uh, and so here's uh, if we don't need the derivative, there's an additional argument to to the Bellman as well. Then uh, we just return this. If the, we asked for the derivative, then the Frechet derivative is also calculated. And this is how it's done. So first we say that uh, this is the uh, element by element, right? This, the, by, this, this uh, operation is element by element uh, multiplication. We multiply the transition probability with the matrix, which is uh, uh, broadcasted from the uh, uh, row vector of choice probabilities. And the fact that it's uh, a row vector and it's going to be broadcasted down uh, to fill uh, the matrix. It's like it's, we make it a row vector, the PK, and it will be broadcasted like this. And then it will be multiplied element by element to the transition probabilities that have the band diagonal structure. right? And this will give us the first uh, component of our two component free share calculation. Of course, we should remember to multiply by beta as well. And then the first column of this, uh, of this uh, matrix, to that we need to add another beta times the uh, transition probability now multiplied in the matrix way to the probability of keeping. Oh, and I should, I should say that, I'm sorry, probability of replacing. I should say that now PK is gonna be probability of keeping, PK. Uh, and here we are multiplying, multiplying by the probability of replacing. And so these two lines is all it takes to implement the Frechet derivative. Uh, is, uh, you know, the, the derivation and understanding what it is, is uh, takes a lot longer than, uh, than the implementation in the code and the, and the runtime is not going to be affected all too much. But uh, now we can uh, uh, introduce this new solver, the NK solver. And uh, all it does is uh, it basically applies the uh, uh, 
uh, it calls Bellman uh, uh, operator and remembers the derivative, the Frechet derivative of the operator. It starts initializes at some uh, at zero, as before. And as I said, this is going to be uh, this is going to be important, but zeros seem to work a lot of the times as well. And now this is the uh, the Newton Kantorovich step. Uh, if we look to the formula, we had to invert the uh, um, we had to invert the uh, uh, the identity matrix minus the derivative, uh, and then multiply that to the um, uh, uh, and multiply that to the output of the uh, uh, identity minus the Bellman operator, normal one. So the output of the Bellman operator is a vector. Of course, identity times the uh, uh, times the uh, input is just that input itself. And so E V naught minus E V one. That's the uh, uh, return from the I minus uh, gamma applied to E V naught. Right, because gamma returns EV1, that's the Bellman operator, and identity returns EV0. But this is a vector, and now we have to multiply that vector with the inverse of the matrix. And this is pretty much the same as solving a system of linear equations. And therefore, I'm using this uh, Lean-Alc solve uh, to perform this uh, uh, operation um, uh, due to the optimization that is uh, included into the implementation of Lean-Alc solve. Okay, and so uh, in Linalc uh, solve, we are given it this matrix, which is the identity matrix minus the uh, Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator. Uh, and uh, uh, it's like the right-hand side of the linear system is this uh, identity matrix minus the Bellman operator applied to the EV0, the previous iteration's expected value vector. And so uh, this, this line then forms the newton kantorovich step and uh, now we can calculate the convergence, uh, or the, the, uh, the uh, or divergence, should I say, the error, which is then compared to the tolerance. And we have the usual callback, uh, although in this implementations I've also updated uh, the, uh, some parameters in the callbacks to say, you know, which method is being used. We also here, we are remembering the previous step uh, divergence. Uh, because that's going to be uh, interesting to analyze, as you will see. And once the convergence has been achieved, because we are using PK from the next period, I'm uh, also uh, recalculating this uh, this PK one more time. Uh, this is just to um, uh, this is just to get the updated uh, choice probabilities calculated from the actually converged values of EV one. Okay, and that's a return. We'll skip safe uh, poly now, uh, or solve poly now, and then uh, for solve show, uh, the difference is that we now can choose the uh, solution method, and then uh, what turn off the uh, plot and and do some verbosity output, ver verbose output uh, from the iterations. Okay, this this uh, th these are the differences compared to the code that we developed in video twenty nine, but th they are not uh, drastic as you can see. All right, so let's uh, first compare the uh, um, uh, successive approximation uh, solution, the VFI, to the NK, the newton kantorovich In the setting where beta is 0.9, the rest of the parameters are default values, and those actually come from, the, from John's paper from 1987. You can see beta here is 4 nines, which is pretty hard, right? This is very close to 1, and therefore uh, the modulus of contraction uh, um, is very close to one, and that means that we are contracting really, really slowly. It will take a whole bunch of iterations for the successive approximation solver to arrive at the solution. And yet that's the true, that's the value from the paper. Um, you know, 30 years ago, uh, John was solving this model many, many, many times, and you can see why the newton kantorovich is really needed, uh, or you will see in a second. Uh, look, um, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the solution produced by the value function iteration. Uh, you know, we start with zeros and then we converge in value function space and this is the corresponding probability of uh, keeping the engine, right? So we are, uh, with higher probability, we're keeping the new engines and then the probability of keeping false 
although uh, it doesn't fall too far. It's uh, still about 99996. Uh, the probability is falling, but not too much. Now, um, how many iterations did it take to converge? It took 123, 123 iterations. And uh, compare that to the newton kantorovich which uh, converged in two iterations. Two iterations. This is quite a difference, as you can see, and you may ask yourself, did we get the same answer? And, uh, well, looking at the graphs, uh, it seems that we did. And then uh, I've coded up this couple of lines here to compare the, uh, the, the outputs, the solutions from the two methods. And you can see that they uh, differ by uh, 10 to the minus 6 in value function, uh, uh, well, it's expected value function, uh, and the, uh, uh, what, 10 to the minus 12 in the uh, policy. Of course, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 6 comes from the fact that we are converging to this tolerance. Uh, and if I increase the tolerance for the solvers, we'll have to wait a little longer, but you can see that immediately the, the difference between the value functions falls down to 10 to the minus uh, uh, 10. Um, Mm, now it took three iterations for Newton Kantorovich to converge. So, um, what 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 happens if I start increasing beta, say to 0.999? Well, first we have to wait. And then it said what uh, couldn't converge in a thousand and five hundred iterations. Well, let's maybe increase that, five thousand iterations. As you can see, value function iterations is a surefire method, globally convergent, but maybe really slow. And um, as I said, the original, the original um, uh, beta that is estimated in the paper, and I've included the paper here in static. Oh no, this is a manual. Uh, this this is this is the uh, optimal replacements of GMC bus engines. Uh, Kinematric uh, 1987. Let's find the uh, results. So John is doing some specification search for the uh, cost function, and here's the result. Structural estimates, and here's the discount factor, which was not estimated, was kept fixed. And uh, uh, here you can see four nines. Let's see, um, well, we'll start easy with two nines. Uh, uh, VFI converged in 2,154 iterations, whereas newton Kantorovich took eight iterations to produce exactly the same answer. All right, so uh, here are the questions to, uh, to, to, to think about. Does VFI always converge? What determines the speed of convergence of the VFI algorithm? What about uh, newton Kantarovich? Does it always converge? I think I can turn on, give you 10 seconds. Okay, as you probably all remember by now, VFI is globally convergent. And so it does always converge. It's just a question of how fast. Uh, the speed of convergence is determined by the Bellman, op, uh, Bellman, I'm sorry, the beta value, the value of the discount coefficient. What about the NK? Does it always converge? Well, we know from, uh, uh, from our uh, lecture on the Newton method that uh, it is important to start Newton in the uh, uh, domain of attraction. Uh, so that it could converge. And in fact, at, uh, if you start it at some points distant uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the solution, that it may diverge or, or go into cycles uh, or, or, or converge, but also very slowly. So it does matter where you start Newton and it does not always converge. 
And so um, we have this, this trade-off, right? The, the VFI is, is globally convergent, but might be very slow. newton kantorovich uh, is quadratically convergent. Uh, but you have to start it at some uh, at some uh, uh, you know good point. It's very sensitive to the starting point. Um, here are some more tests um, to show uh, uh, to, to hint us on the uh, uh, on the speed of convergence on the convergence rate. Uh, we started with VFI, um, you know. And uh, uh, this prints the iteration number and the error, which is uh, uh, just the, the just the uh, the difference between the previous and the new uh, uh, approximation of the value function. And you can see as we go through the iterations, the error does decrease. It decreases all the time. In fact, right, but it decreases quite slowly. So it's ten to the minus two, uh, to three. Four, five, six. We need to get it down to uh, standard one is uh, minus eight, I think. No, minus uh, six it must be. So it took 496 iterations. Now with uh, Newton Kantorovich, this is the typical picture that you see. If you don't start it nicely in the good in the good spot, then it may wander around a little bit. So if few iterations, you know, we are not really decreasing the error. But once it gets into the region of attraction, then look what happens. It goes from 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus minus 13. Uh, so it doubles doubles the uh, 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 the accuracy or, or, or reduces the magnitude of the error uh, uh, in half uh, every, every iteration. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, st we still converge to the same, to the same solution. Uh, this, is what, this is what the quadratic convergence is, right? So it's, a, it's doubling of the order of the magnitude on each iteration. That's why Newton is so powerful. Uh, but as you can see, it can be very slow in the beginning. So poly algorithm is a good idea then. Uh, the idea being that um, um, we start with uh, successive approximations. We start with a globally convergent method, and then uh, after so many iterations where it moves towards the solution, but maybe slowly, we switch uh, um, to the newton kantorovich iterations, which then has a chance to converge very fast, you know, being started from a good, with a good point. Now, an approximately optimal uh, time or iteration switch to the newton kantorovich It's hard to know when is a good time, but this is exactly the Pauli algorithm uh, that is part of the paper uh, uh, that allows for the uh, uh, four digits, four, four nines after the uh, uh, decimal point to be estimated. Let's uh, try to think about when it would be uh, a good idea or a good iteration to switch to the newton kantorovich And here's the uh, argument that gives uh, raise, rise to the, uh, to the heuristics that is actually used. Uh, so suppose that at some iteration uh, k minus one, we are a constant away from the uh, fixed point. So ev is a function, right? It's a vector, and so this is like the, the a vector shifted, uh, you know, in the same shape uh, to a different to a different location by a constant. So let's think about the uh, the uh, this uh, uh, the the uh, uh, error that we're calculating in the algorithm by comparing the previous to the current iteration. Well, we know that this is uh, a constant away from the solution, and this is the operator applied to this. Now, uh, from the structure of the operator, uh, we can take the constant out with a beta, and this is the, you can verify this. Uh, and then we are left with c times uh, 1 minus beta, okay? If we do the same uh, uh, analysis for the next iteration and compare the iteration k plus 1 to iteration k, uh, then the, the, the operator is applied twice and we'll get a beta and a beta square and this formula here. 
And so that means that dividing one over, over the other, we should get beta, uh, dividing one error over the other error, we should get beta when uh, the solution is a constant away, uh, I'm sorry, the approximation is a constant away from the true solution, from the fixed point. Well, uh, you can, uh, uh, it, it's, it's easy to see that uh, the newton kantorovich will, uh, you know, strip away the constant. It will jump over the constant right uh, 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 in, in, in one iteration. Um, this is like... Um, Well, you can verify that the constant disappears in the Newton in the Newton step, uh, um, right? Um, so, the point of the heuristic is that when we are getting close to the constant by looking at the uh, at the um, uh, ratio of the two consecutive uh, um, uh, 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 errors in the uh, in the iteration in, uh, as we go through the newton kantorovich iteration when this term is getting close to our beta that's a good that's when it might be a good time to switch to newton kantorovich iterations and uh, this gives rise to the poly algorithm which is uh, already in the code as well um, Here it is. It requires some additional parameters, like the minimum number of successive approximations and the maximum number of su successive approximations to perform, and the switching tolerance, right? The tolerance and the switching rule. How close do we have to be to beta to switch to the newton kantorovich iteration? And of course, this uh, parameter, switching tolerance, might be uh, uh, chosen differently for different values of beta. So this additional technical parameters, they uh, facilitate the heuristic, which is not really an automatic thing. Um, but what, what happens in this loop is uh, that we are taking uh, the, uh, uh, well, we are evaluating the Bellman uh, together with fresh, fresh A derivative just in case, and we're looking at this uh, tolerance, and then we compare it to um, uh, you know, as say mean and say max, these two lines implement the switching rules. And if the error between this ratio uh, is close enough to beta, then we are also switching to uh, uh, to, to, to the uh, newton kantorovich And so if we are in newton kantorovich iterations, then we're also performing the, the NK step uh, uh, in order to update the, the uh, EV function even further. Uh, right, uh, and the rest of the loop is the same. So let's see how the uh, poly algorithm performs. Uh, this is um, these these are the, these are the uh, the value function iterations again. Uh, uh, that's a demonstration of this ratio of the uh, current step, current iteration error to divided by the previous iteration error. Uh, look that beta is 0.975, and as we go through the uh, iterations, this ratio slowly moves, you know, it fluctuates a bit, and then, uh, and then towards the end, when the, when the algorithm converges, uh, it, it converges to 0.975 indeed, over here. And so it's looking, it's looking to at, at, at this value here that we can decide when it's, uh, a, when it's a good time to start newton kantorovich iterations where we are already sufficiently enough into the uh, domain of attraction. Um, so here with 975, I'm running several solvers just to demonstrate how they, uh, uh, how they perform one after another. Uh, VFI 860 iterations, uh, you know, pure Newton converged in seven iterations, uh, which would be the best, right? Well, we got lucky. It's uh, important to say here that it could be that we can't converge at all uh, with Newton because uh, it is sensible, uh, sensitive to the starting, uh, starting point. But with Pauli algorithm here, uh, you know, it starts with uh, successive approximation iterations, and uh, it performs so many of them. How many? 76 or 77 if we start from zero. 
until the uh, ratio, our criterion satisfies the uh, the set um, tolerance level here. And then uh, switching after switching to Newton, oh, and you can see that the, the that the error decreases slowly. Uh, uh, the magnitude goes uh, down, but very slowly. And then we switch to Newton Kantorovich uh, minus three, minus six, minus twelve. In three iterations, it basically covers this gap. You know, it approximates slowly and then just jumps to the solution right, 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 uh, straight to it. So let's see how the original uh, 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 parameterization works with poly algorithm. Well, it's solved in 71 iterations here, uh, and it takes about, what, 14 uh, milliseconds, so 14 thousandths of a second uh, to arrive at the solution. So, you know, overall, it's not a very complicated problem uh, these days, but uh, it was 30 years ago for sure. The paper is in the uh, in the PDF folder, uh, and um, you can uh, you can also take a look at this nice video on the on the order of convergence convergence rates of different uh, solvers. See you in the next video.